welcome. I'm Michael Farthing. Um, I'm chair of the West Pier Trust, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to this, what I'm sure is going to be a spectacular uh, entertainment led by Professor Fred Gray, who is our historian and archivist, and someone who's had a long standing history in, in the seaside, its so social and cultural implications. Um, and indeed, particularly its architecture. Now, he's written books before about the seaside, and this new book, published just last week, The Architecture of British Seaside Piers, is his latest offering. And we're going to have uh, a, a, co a conversation um, about the book. Um, Fred will make um, a series of short um, introductions about various aspects of the book. And um, I very much hope that you will stay with us and, in, and enjoy the session. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Fred Gray and ask Fred just to um, start us going. And I, I think, per Fred, perhaps I'll um, start with a, with, with a question, really. How did you, your interest in, in seaside and peer architecture develop? Um, thank you, Michael. And it's good to, good to be talking with you. Um, I guess people of a certain age um, have experienced the seaside uh, or the English seaside for a long period of time. And my first experiences date back to the 1950s, 1960s as a London child. Um, but once I moved to Sussex and started teaching in adult education, it was clear that people living in Worthing or Hastings or Eastbourne were really interested in their seaside locations. And I started to teach about the seaside. And in fact, the lo local people I was working with teaching, they often knew more about it than I did. So it became a, an exchange of ideas. I was bringing academic ideas. They were bringing real histories. And that led to in my interest in seaside architecture, seaside places. Like many people, I think I'm quite, um, I, quite enjoy rather seedy rundown seaside places in winter although somewhere like Brighton or Margate main, main sands on a lovely sunny seaside day is wonderful. How do you go about writing a book like this because you know it spans I guess now almost uh, two, 200 years in terms of history not quite perhaps how do, how, do, how, do, how, do, how do you start and what techniques do you use to pull together, for instance, all the more than 300 illustrations in the book, which are very diverse. Yes, um, it's a fascinating process of trying to put, put, put together a jigsaw puzzle, but at the start of it, you have a few pieces of the jigsaw in terms of ideas, in terms of images, and then it's, it's a question of trying to make more or less a complete jigsaw. There are always some pieces that are missing. There are some illustrations that um, I couldn't afford to include, illustrations that I know are there, but I couldn't find. Um, and there are ideas which develop over time. So I think the process of researching and writing a book like this one is uh, immensely enjoyable, sometimes frustrating, but overall immensely enjoyable process. I like um, when I'm writing to see ideas firm up and develop and what I start off thinking in terms of an idea often changes as I write. As I look at new pictures, um, those things change. So, um, so it, it's a process of, of development and engagement, which I just find absolutely fascinating. Great, well, why don't you introduce us to, I think, towards the beginning of the book, when you talk about the early origins of peers and where they've come from, and indeed, what, what is a peer? How, how do we define what a peer is? Okay, I'll do that. And um, let me start off though, Michael, with a quote which I came across yesterday, in fact, it's from J.G. Ballard, that wonderful novelist. And he said, or one of his characters said, all the most interesting things in the world take place where the sea meets the land and you're between those two states of mind. On that border zone, you're neither one or the other, you're both. And I think it's a great quote because of course, peers do both. The um, book starts off by, by exploring some of the structures that existed before 
um, piled piers. And this is a lovely view of the cob at, at Lyme Regis. Um, it's an ancient structure. It's um, parts of it are 700 or more years old. Um, and it's been remade many, many times. And of course, it's, it's not a pier, but it's a place where people promenade, walk out, chat to each other, look at nature, look, look at e each other. And that seems to me to be the essence of, of a pier. It's a place to, um, where nature and society meet. Um, and it's a place which is environment shifting. It's um, rather than a time machine, it's an environment machine. Um, although we also reflect on time as well. This is um, another early structure, uh, early 19th century Margate Pier. It's called a pier rather than a jetty, but it's a harbour arm. And what's fascinating about this, I think, is just the way it reflects one of the tensions at the seaside between the working area of the seaside here with fishermen um, and women and up above polite promenaders with their um, fence, the lighting, the, um, the band enclosure. So that tension I think has been at the seaside and on seaside piers for some time. And this is a picture of the jetty, not a pier, but the jetty at Great Yarmouth. It dates from the mid 1790s. And I think this is the first um, seaside pier, um, the, the first seaside promenade pier. It shows polite society walking on the pier. There are people down here selling objects to the uh, strollers on the pier. But it's, it's earlier than the Peer experts talk about the first pier being right on, on the Isle of Wight in 1814, but this is 20 years before that. There are issues and definitions about what constitutes a pier. This is Margate um, in the 1950s, and we can see three piers effectively, or two piers and one jetty. This is uh, what was known as the sun deck. It's a piled structure and it included when it was built in the, in the 1920s, a, a promenade pier. And then on the horizon, you can see the Margate stone pier, which I've spoken about. And beyond that, just a glimpse of what was called Margate jetty, but was actually Margate piled pier. So what is a pier? What does it look like? Um, is this a pier? This is in Worthing. It's worth in Lido, uh, but it, again, it's a piled structure. These are the sorts of debates that peer experts get into. I, I think ultimately they're a little bit frustrating. Uh, we should be, be concentrating on what, what peers do and how they perform and how people have enjoyed them over time. Herm Bay Pier in the 1850s, it's a wooden structure and piers at this point performed two roles really. Um, they were landing stages, crucial landing stages, carrying people from the big cities down to the, the emerging seaside resorts, and secondly, places of promenade. So it's a wooden structure, a piled wooden structure for as a landing stage and a promenade. And during this period, um, there was a period of exp um, experimentation uh, here is a fantastic view, I think, of the chain pier in Brighton. Chain pier was opened in 1823 and one of just three chain piers built, but the designer, Samuel Brown, was experimenting. It's built on wooden foundations, but these huge um, iron chains. And the technology um, ultimately didn't work and um, instead, uh, pier builders look to other ways of, of, mil of building piers. And one final point in this section, I just wanted to say that one of the amazing things about seaside piers is just how they tend to develop and change over time. So these are four views of Eastbourne Pier um, and the entrance of Eastbourne Pier. Um, top left hand corner, the original entrance kiosks guarding the entrance of the pier. And then a later, on the top right corner, a later heavier Victorian version of those entrance kiosks. Um, bottom left, a lovely 1950s, early 1950s 
classic festival Britain style piece of architecture, which I absolutely love. Um, the photograph was taken just as it, it was be, going to be pulled down. So it's dated 1990. And then a photograph in the bottom right of the entrance nowadays. And it's a heavy uh, pastiche of Victoriana, which I don't think works anywhere near as well as the 1950s version of the entrance. But nonetheless, um, there's much more shop space. Fred, do you want to say a, a few words about um, how the materials over, over this period of early period of time changed? I mean, I was very interested to read in the book about the early use of wooden piles. And indeed, the city of Venice was built on wooden piles. And I learned only um, earlier this year that in fact those wooden piles become petrified with time and in fact are very durable and I just wonder why we gave up wooden piling and went on to cast iron and then much steel and use of concrete and how those other materials crept in. Yes, um, I think part of the answer is that wood was easily available, easy to shift, um, easy to supply and working on the first wooden piers on in places like the Thames Estuary, which was the classic Ordnance Survey description was sand and mud. Uh, wood could be sunk into sand and mud very easily. Equally on a ride on the Isle of Wight, it's sand and mud. So it was easy to get the piles in and to fix them. But um, the fix intended to be um, not all that permanent. It appears needed to be remade again and again. And frequently the big problem of seaside piers made of wood was worm. Um, they would be eaten away and sometimes piers would have to be remade just after a few years. So it was a, um, always a temporary structure really, although they were being built for permanence, um, they got attacked by everything from storms to to worm and so there was a search on for other materials I think that's what the chain pier in Brighton was trying was exploring so it was built on big wooden piles but using iron um, of course just at the time when new materials in terms of the in, uh, industrial change in Britain and Britain's industrial might new materials are coming on the scene and how important was the development of the railways to the expansion of, of interest in peers and development of peers. You suggest in the book that the two are very closely linked. Yes, and they're linked in, they're linked in interesting ways. Um, the railways ultimately meant that most peers stopped having a functional landing stage role, apart from for pleasure journeys by paddle steamer and pleasure steamer. Um, so they undercut the carrying of people from London to, say, Southend or Margate. Um, but the railways had a fascinating impact in terms of technology. So some of the technologies of railways was subsequently used for piers. Things such as screw piling and cast iron columns were all partly products of uh, railway engineering. So it's uh, both a negative consequence, but also... A positive consequence but ultimately railways would bring millions of people to to different seaside places where they would often enjoy seaside piers. Well thanks Sh should we move on then to perhaps get you to say a few words about the what you call the golden age of, of, of British piers. So as I said the technology of um, industrial Britain was brought to bear in, uh, in peer building. Um, one of the great technologies um, once um, wood gave way to iron was the screw pile and there's a on the right hand side there's a screw pile, a wrought iron screw pile in this case that um, was extracted from the West Pier 20 years ago. On the left hand side of the picture, there's a very rare, fascinating example of, um, of a screw pile being put in place, uh, being winched round and driven down into the, into the seabed at, at low tide. This slide shows how peer designers attempted to cope with the problem of getting people from the sea to land and vice versa. The top uh, engraving shows Margate uh, central jetty now the central pier 
and the low level landing stage, um, which was used at low tide to get people from sea to land. Um, it strikes me it must have been a terribly uh, slippery business to walk along that, that jetty. Um, the larger picture shows the pier at Plymouth on, on the Hoe and this very curious graduated landing stage circling the pier, again trying to cope with the business of different states of tide. And the final picture from about 2010 shows work on rebuilding the landing stage at, on Worthing Pier and those great timber bolts being put in, in place. The greatest pier designer, and one of the things I'd just like to focus on a little bit, was Eugenius Birch. He was by far the most important pier designer in terms of the number of piers built from, the, from his first pier in 1855 to his last pier in 1884. But more than that, he was important for his design innovations, his in engineering innovations. Um, and architectural ch um, uh, ideas. This is a picture from 1863 of uh, his view of how the West Pier in Brighton was going to look. And as and the West Pier opened in 1866, and the, the, the entrance kiosks here were more or less built as he shows them here. Uh, Birch was a great watercolorist. So with, um, those were more or less built um, as he displays them. But otherwise the pier was totally different. Um, the configuration of piles was very different. These are based on his first Margate pier piles. And there was no intention of putting the building on the pier head originally. I think this is Birch doodling around, thinking about how a pier head pavilion might look. But this is still a promenade pier. It's a place to walk and the money from it comes from uh, entrance tolls and fees from people landing by boats. The pier as built in, in, in Brighton um, was totally different. It was ornate. It had six kiosks on it apart from its uh, two entrance toll booths. It had a bandstand. It had um, weather shelters, weather screens. It had ornate um, seating, wonderfully entrancing um, uh, dragon or snake in entwined uh, lamp standards. So very different from a plain fun functional pier. And one of the great questions is where did Birch get his ideas from? And increasingly, I think there's a sense that Birch was learning from and applying um, the ideas of a great mid 19th century um, theorist about design and color, someone called Owen Jones, who in, in 1856 um, published a book called The Grammar of Ornament, where he looks at the designs from a whole range of different societies around the world. And this, these are designs um, from the uh, Alhambra Palace in Spain and Jones was especially interested in what he called Moorish, uh, what we'd call nowadays Islamic designs. And I think what um, Birch was trying to do was to make in cast iron um, very much that, uh, those designs from, uh, from Spain. So we have this curious notion of Moorish Islamic designs going into Spain and then being translated in cast iron. It on on piers in in Britain, with the West Pier in Brighton being the first pier where that happens. From there, um, what was sometimes called ornamental, sometimes oriental pier pavilions spread around the coast. Bottom left, Hastings. Top left, Morecambe. Uh, and the wonderful pavilion there was called the Taj Mahal of the North the fine top right uh, pavilion on the end of the Palace Pier that opened in 1901. And these ornamental oriental designs spread around the world. So the bottom right hand picture is of um, the pier in Nice.
so ornamental design um, was uh, oriental design was terribly important but that was only one motif and in, uh, peer, peer designers turned to other ideas as well this is the wellington wellington pier in great yarmouth and by 1903 the borough engineer um, also a, a peer designer sydney cockerell uh, designed this wonderful art nouveau pavilion which still sat, stands it's been pulled down and rebuilt in various ways it's lost a, a lot of its decoration but it's still in great yarmouth nowadays so um by the end of the 19th century i think orientalism was starting to wane and it was never totally dominant anyway so that was fascinating i think um orientalism uh, that word the use of that word is often criticized today uh, it's obviously clearly linked with empire and um our colonial past my view is that um uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery and I, I, I think many Victorians um, and in, indeed going into the Edwardian age genuinely were absolutely fascinated by that uh, by, by those cultures they they, they love the art forms and, and by and large a designer wouldn't use an art form that he found abhorrent and of course the same operates for um, for, for other grand um, buildings in Brighton for example I don't know what what your thoughts are about that I, um, I think you're ultimately right, Michael, that the people um, designing those buildings and using the buildings, the holidaymakers seeking pleasure and joy and fun, to listen to music, uh, to watch entertainment, um, they would have been aware of the, of the architectural detail, but um, I don't think they'd have very often thought about any deeper colonial, imperial, empire reason. Um, I think what seaside designers were trying to do was to develop a language, an architectural language, um, which was different from the mundane language of London, architectural language of London or Manchester. So these were special um, uh, entrancing places. It's it's an architecture that is uh, it's an architecture of pleasure um, and delight rather than work or home. In the in the introduction uh, to, to your book, you talk about the, the sort of almost the philosophy of the horizon, and and I wondered also whether bringing this architectural these architectural concepts to peers was part of trying to open our, our horizons in, in, a, in a metaphysical sort of way, as well as a physical way, um, for, for the British um, holidaymaker. Yes, I think you're right. Of course, people could venture off a pier onto a, um, a paddle steamer and take a voyage over the channel in the case of Brighton or Weymouth or along the coast. But I, I think that notion of speculating standing at the end of, end of the pier and speculating about the past, the present and the future, thinking about other parts of the world was something that, that uh, peers allowed people to do. Um, I, I also think that people are still intrigued by peers in a whole series of different ways. Um, you can go onto a pier and look at children peering over the edge of the pier or through the deck and wondering what's in the sea below and being sometimes quite scared of it. Some adults are scared of peers as well. So <laughs> they are, they allow us uh, insights into mysterious places. Shall we, shall we move on? I mean, um, about sort of two thirds of the way through the book, you cover this very interesting period in peer history, which is the between the wars period when we got interested in modernism and indeed sunshine the period from 1910 onwards um, saw a great change in people's attitude to the seaside there was a turning away from the, the victorian period and victorian architecture and people started to enjoy the sun and more and more people learned to swim it was a, um, the nature of fashion changed there was a absolutely massive turning away from the 19th century and a look forward into new ways of enjoying the seaside 
And it's a period when seaside Lido's were being built, parks and gardens were opening up. So people were starting to try to get a suntan even on the beach. And those piers that had been built during the 19th century, and really pier building came to an end in 1910, 1912, um, um, those piers were really ill-equipped to, to cater for um, the sun and that's where actually fire comes to to the rescue quite often when a pier catches fire um, and a, an old Victorian pavilion is uh, destroyed it's an opportunity for pier builders to um, develop new 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 more modern modern structures this is Colwyn Bay Pier showing the three pavilions um, early 20th century, 19, uh, burnt down, very quickly rebuilt, and the bottom left pavilion is very quickly burnt down again, accidentally burnt down. And finally, there's this lovely modernist streamlined structure, which reflects um, the styles of the day. And that survives in Colwyn Bay until just two or three years ago. Of all the piers, the one that perhaps most took to this modernist uh, uh, aesthetic of, of seaside architecture and seaside play and tried to meet the new ways of enjoying the seaside was Clacton Pier. And it, absolutely massive pier in terms of its, its total area. And you can see here a fun fair, and of course, subsequently, many peers carried fun fairs, theatres, entertainment venues, and extraordinarily, an open air swimming pool with, um, with places for spectators. I just love the idea of swimming over the sea uh, in an open air swimming pool. Some of that structure is still there. It's no longer used as a swimming pool, though. But Clacton Pier was a wonderful example of how to build um, a new leisure structure for a, 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 an ever larger market. But my favourite 1930s pier is undoubtedly Worthing, and it still survives more or less unchanged. Um, and the Pierhead Pavilion um, is a, starts off life as a lovely cafe uh, dance venue and sun lounge with interior and exterior places to um, to enjoy the sun. And it takes something from that uh, nautical modern style of architecture, uh, pretended to be part of an ocean liner. The final pier built in the 1930s, um, and indeed what the um, final pier to be built before the Second World War was Weymouth Bandstand Pier, a short stubby structure and basically a dance hall, an open air dance hall. Um, and some of it survives now. It's interesting that this pier shows the evolution of, of material ideas. So by the 1930s, um, concrete was the, was the material in fashion and, and was used in, in places like Clacton and, and in this Weymouth bandstand as well. And all of that changed. The sunny seaside was ground to a, a very sudden halt in 1939. And around the coast, most piers were sectioned, but um, they were cut in two, or in some cases three, um, to, um, as the threat of invasion increased. And during the war, many, many piers suffered. So um, the uh, top left picture shows um, Worthing, Worthing Pier being sectioned. The top right shows the ill-fated St. Leonard's Pier burning down um, it, uh, uh, during the war, um, a, an accidental blaze. The bottom left photograph shows uh, the glorious F Folkestone Pier, or what had been a glorious pier in Folkestone. It survived the war, survived bombardments and uh, missiles whizzing over from France, survived all of that. And just after the war ended, someone got onto the pier and burnt it down. And finally, though, there was hope. Um, so the bottom right picture shows 
uh, Bournemouth Pier being reconstructed after, at the end of the war. Well, that's fascinating, Fred. Um, I, I, I'm, I was always interested in the sectioning of piers during the war. I mean, there was a concern that we might be invaded and that somehow separating the pier from the land would be, would be a smart move. I, I never quite understood that, though. What do you think behind that? Yes, I, and well, like you, Michael, I'm unsure whether it's more of a symbolic action that it's uh, pulling up of the drawbridge um, to demonstrate um, that uh, we're closed for business, so to speak, and that um, we're not going to be invaded, or whether th there was a real concern that piers could be a really potential threatening landing point for enemy troops. I think it may be a combination of the two um, that uh, peers could in theory have been at least the starting point of, of invasion, but bear in mind that of course most of the beaches around the south and east coast were covered in minefields and fired wire anyway, so perhaps it was just a logical thing to do. But uh, I think the symbolic nature of it is, is interesting. Um, one episode of that TV series, Dad's Army, features um, features a um, end of the pier escapade at Warmington on Sea, and I was quite pleased to include in the index of my book, Warmington on Sea. <laughs> Great. Well, look. Um, why don't we go on to 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 to, to the the final uh, uh, part of your talk, which is I think you're going to tell us a little bit about the new peers and, and, and perhaps throw in a few ideas about about the future. Turn Bay Pier in 2010. It seems to me this sums up the fortunes of British seaside peers uh, during the post-war period. You can see uh, on the horizon um, the remains of the 1890s pier head, but the rest of the pier apart from the root end, has disappeared. There's a lovely local authority designed um, sports pavilion from dating from 1976, but then this great expanse of water. What happened during the post-war period, I think, was that at first seaside towns responded to prosperity and people visiting the seaside. But then as storms increasingly happened, people stopped visiting the seaside. When a pier was ruined, it was uh, less and less likely to be repaired. There were just two new piers in the post-war period to the year 2000. Deal Pier, a lovely concrete, uh, reinforced concrete pier, and Clarence Pier in Portsmouth. Both of them had been destroyed during the war. There was also an, an, an attempt inventor on the Isle of Wight to build a new pier. Um, it's got a lovely 1950s feel about it with, um, with in terms of its inter, inter, um, in terms of the decoration of its little pavilions. It didn't last very long and by the 1990s it was uh, derelict. And this post-war period is a time when the fortunes of peers vary uh, but there are some desperately sad stories. This is your favourite pier and my favourite pier, Michael. It's the West Pier in Brighton and one of those kiosks that, that we looked at um, and showing change from the late 1960s listing photograph to how the kiosk looked um, 20 years later. But of course it's this kiosk that the West Pier Trust wants to restore. It's the oldest surviving pier building in the world. It's the first example of ornamental oriental architecture over the sea and it's a really worthy cause in terms of, res of restoration and seaside heritage, architectural heritage. Um, piers soak up the character of their individual resorts. Uh, the North Pier in Blackpool two years ago in 2018. Um, and as the fortunes of a seaside town changes, as it uh, improves or declines, so I think piers uh, reflect that. Um, Bournemouth Pier in the top left side, 
and one of the brilliant pier buildings designed by a woman architect, Elizabeth Scott. And you can see here elements of a nautical design. I think this reflects and mirrors an ocean liner with the bridge, the long um, deck of the pier, these wavy lines representing the sea. So an ocean, ocean lining architecture. The bottom right photograph shows the first new pier of the 21st century, Southwold Pier um, being um, enlarged, rebuilt, constructed um, from the year 2000. And it's a pier that soaks up the character of, of the resort and it's very much a Southwold beach hut type of pier, but very successful. In Britain, we haven't followed the lessons of the on the Baltic coast of Germany, or in this case, the large image of, is of a new pier in Italy. We haven't really gone down the route of modernist new piers. I think the best we can point to is Boscombe Pier um, in, uh, in, in Dorset, which has been reconstructed and does have a nice modernist feel, feel to it. So I love the idea of around the coast of Britain building some nice new modern peers. The book concludes by trying to work out just what's happening to seaside peers now and I contrast what I call civic peers with um, amusement peers and these are two examples of civic peers. Saltburn Pier with its lovely cliff railway and then the amazing Clevedon Pier. Uh, in, in Somerset, wonderful. both of them are wonderful structures. Both of them are civic peers in the sense that um, they're dependent on um, either charitable foundations or local authority uh, funding, or, and quite often with large elements of lottery fund money as well. The structure on the left is um, on, on the end of South End Pier, it's called the Royal Pavilion. It's a meeting place, um, a venue. The structure on the right is, uh, is the new cafe on the end of Deal Pier. Uh, it's an ideal place to have uh, a cup of tea over the sea, but both wonderful modern, modern structures. Some piers are in the middle of this continuum between um, civic and amusement piers. So this is the wonderful Cromer Pier owned by the local authority. Uh, which spends a lot of money each year maintaining the structure, but run, um, the Pierhead Theatre is run as a commercial operation. The glorious, staggering Hastings Pier, rebuilt after a fire, and the broad expanse of deck. Um, and Hastings Pier has dithered between being a civic pier and, and, and uh, an amusement pier, and it's, uh, it's had a very checkered history over the last two or three years, but architecturally a, uh, an amazing site. Um, some piers have been rebuilt, some amusement piers have been re re rebuilt. Amusement piers, I think, are a combination of sometimes fun fairs, amusement arcade, uh, arcades, gambling machines, and this is Felix though Pier. You can see the original pier building in the top left and then the brand new pier building. I think these two towers are architecturally a feature of amusement piers and you can see them on the pier in, in um, Western Super, Supermare for example um, and I, it probably dates back to that Wellington Pier in Great Yarmouth and uh, it's the, the two towers are all, also appear, of course, on Bryson Pier. Bryson Pier is the, or the Palace Pier, I should say. Bryson Palace Pier is the most successful, um, commercially successful pier in Britain. And it's uh, an ideal example of amusement piers. So I think this combination, the way forward of civic piers and amusement piers, uh, um, is going to be the pattern for the next few years at least, but ultimately we can't predict the future for seaside peers with any great certainty.
Well, Fred, thank you. And that's brought us really right, right up to date. I've just got one or two thoughts that I'd like you to, to, to think about. I mean, you mentioned fire. Fire seems to have um, uh, been damaging to many of our peers. And, and I mean, I guess there are different reasons why, but I just wonder what your thoughts are about the role of fire in determining peer history. Yes, it's uh, fire has been the, probably the most Im single important um, agent of change, um, along with storm, those two things, storm and fire, in terms of sweeping away radically altering peers. Um, one of the curious things, of course, about fires on piers is that although they're surrounded by water, it's often proved amazingly difficult to get the water onto the pier to quench the fire. Um, and sometimes fires are started accidentally. Sometimes, as in the case of Folkestone and the West Pier, it's the result of arson attacks. Um, sometimes it's people, um, the workmen, the work people on a pier um, accidentally set fire to a structure. But uh, fires are agents of change, and depending on the optimism of the peer owners, whether it's a local authority or a, or a private business, it provides a chance for a new peer or a new structure to be built. But if the optimism isn't there, if the fate of the resort is, um, is thought to be quite poor, then the peer won't be rebuilt and it will literally disappear. So, um, so fire is, is an agent, agent of change, but it's difficult to predict exactly how it's used. I mean, you, you mentioned um, arson, and indeed, um, we believe that the West Pier was, was subject to an, an attack. I mean, it leads inevitably onto the question, you know, is there room for more than one pier in, in a town? I mean, uh, Brighton's had three piers. I'm not sure whether they were all extent at the same time. Black Blackpool still got three peers. Yes, um, I th you're right. Brighton did have three peers, um, and uh, although the um, the chain pier um, blew down just before the Palace Pier opened, so um, they it didn't have three functioning peers. Um, I think the answer is some seaside towns can, will be able to support more than one pier, although it depends on the fortunes of the seaside town, how large it is, its visitor population, the nature of the visitor population. But I would love to see, for example, in, in Brighton and other seaside towns, but it's certainly in Brighton, a brand new West Pier, which wouldn't attempt to reproduce how the West Pier was in the past, but it could be a startling modern structure, um, perhaps carrying a, an art gallery, but certainly a place to speculate about the future and the past, to walk over the sea. Um, which could be a real brilliant addition to Brighton Seafront. Fred, uh, before we close, I, I'd just like you to um, make one comment. One of, one of the things that has always struck me is how often peers find their way into novels, literature, film, uh, even theatre. And um, I mean, I, the, one of the very first images you showed, which was of the cob in, in Lyme Regis, of course, appears in Jane Austen's novel Persuasion, when a, when a young lady, um, dressed inappropriately, I would have thought, I mean, appropriately for the time, but um, jumped from those steps, which you showed in that image, into the arms of a potential um, uh, lover below. And I, I, I just wonder what your take is on why peers are so attractive to novelists, filmmakers, um, writers in general? Yes, um, I think it partly goes back to uh, the fact that the pier is crossing these two environments. It's taken us out over the mysterious sea. It allows us to look at horizons. But we also know that piers can be places of, of no return. That um, And certainly the people penning fictions, whether it's film or in a novel, often use peers as this no return cul-de-sac. Um, but they're places where, because it's, it's not work, it's not home life, um, there's a sense that 
at times peers can provide opportunities for engagement that aren't that isn't possible elsewhere. Uh, Patrick Hamilton talked about the West Pier as being um, a great sexual machine throwing the sexes together and there is that frisson of um, of possibility for some people on on peers and that's leaving aside what goes on under the pier so i think uh, peers uh, offer a whole series of, of possibilities well what a wonderful note to end on fred thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure to to listen to you um, to get a taster of this um, spectacular book, which I'm pleased to say uh, is published. Um, it is available in the West Pier Centre in Brighton, if that's convenient for you. Um, and um, uh, I think it's going to be a huge success. This was a, a, a free talk, um, but as you know, these are difficult times for um, small charities like our own. So if you did feel moved to make a donation, and we would be um, very grateful and you can do this through our website westpeer.co.uk uh, um, uh, and as Fred mentioned we do have a big project on at the moment which is to reconstruct that fantastic Eugenius Birch uh, kiosk we call it the kiosk it's a, if you like a small pavilion um, and we are preparing to reconstruct that onto uh, a reserve spot just in front of the West Pier Centre on West Beach. Um, I very much hope you've enjoyed this session. We'd be uh, very pleased to hear from you um, if you did and if you've got any constructive criticisms that would also be gratefully received and I hope this will be the first of a number of similar talks about relevant topics um, to ourselves and, and to Brighton and the seaside in, in general. Thank you so much for joining us.